Hmm. Look how flushed okay. my cheeks are. Do you have a I fever? I look really rosy. <laughs> 99.8. I mean, that's... It's not technically crazy. a fever. Yeah. But it is technically huh. a fever. This is uh, baby's first COVID. My God. Asthma sucks. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. I know. Yep. It got me. It got me good. I was out oh, yeah. for the count. I'm going to be all <laughs> roided out reading Daddy Nikdos and be like, ah! <laughs> There are worse things, I suppose. Definitely. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Shadow Baddies Book Club, where two dehydrated cousins escape reality by launching headfirst and tits out into romance novels. Journey with us as we discuss our current reads, our endless TBR, our favorite tropes, and hash out some unhinged theories. I'm Elise. And I'm Darcy, and as always, we would like to remind our listeners that this is an explicit podcast, so hide your kids, pour yourself a glass of something strong, because things are about to get dirty. (laughs) On today's episode, we are chatting about one of our favorite romance tropes, enemies to lovers. But first... Why, why does, uh, why does the first quarter of this year suck so bad? Why, Elise, why is, do you have any why thoughts? Is Q1, why is Q1 getting to us? I don't know. I think that if there's, okay, well, we're in an election year, which we don't like, we don't want to talk about because we all know how this is going to end. So we're not going to go there. So that's already stressful enough. The world is in yep. turmoil. Um, yeah. And then the first quarter for me, I don't know how it is for you, but in the restaurant world, I have to pay all my permits. I have to get all my liquor license in, in, in order. Tax stuff has to be filed. Mm. And on top of it, we're just a little stressed. It's like slow, you know? So you're yeah. doing all of this extra work, but it's slow. And then I know for you, you've got like COVID right now. <laughs> yep. Fuck, the hits just keep on coming like, hitting yeah the hits just yeah. keep on hitting um started yeah. the new year getting laid off um mm-hmm. so i go from being really optimistic one day about be turning 40 this year and starting a new career from the ground up um having a 2 year old we built a new house last year during one of the worst climbs in interest rates There's a lot going on over here. (laughs) Definitely using uh, literature and fiction to escape reality every single day because... Oh, 100%. Reality just kind of sucks. It kind of sucks right now. And you know what doesn't? Like, the bad boys. Do you know what I mean? Or like, (laughs) uh, happily ever after, no matter what I'm reading. That doesn't suck. That feels very comfortable to me. (laughs) Yep. Agreed. Agreed. So thank yeah. you for going on this journey with me. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you. I think that these therapy sessions of ours that we are now filming and releasing to the interwebs <laughs> are saving me a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Like we, um, beginning of this month, um, I had family in town, um, for like a total of 10 days all together. And so you and I didn't meet and I felt withdrawals, like my reading slowed down and I was just like, like too focused on being in the present moment, um, which that sounds terrible, but I, it was causing me a lot of stress and anxiety. So now that I'm back to Mm. reading obsessively and and thinking about these fictional characters and their wonderful lives, um, I feel a lot less, a lot less anxiety, except I'm on um, steroids right now to get rid of this cough which is amping up my anxiety. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting, we're figuring interesting it out. time. We're figuring it out. We're figuring it out. Yes. So if you're also going through this Q1 <laughs> nightmare, you're not mm-hmm. alone. Talk, talk about yeah. it. It's okay to talk about yeah. it. It really is. Yeah. What doesn't suck is you know what? enemies what never to sucks. lovers. <laughs> it never sucks. So let's talk. Let's talk about it. On to the therapy. On to the therapy session. (laughs) So enemies to lovers, you know, it's a classic story of guy meets girl or like guy meets guy or gal meets gal, like whatever your preference. Um, 
gal hates guy guy hates gal but is kind of turned on by her and is grappling with the intensity of his attraction until the sexual tension between the two rivals explodes at like i don't know 3 a.m in the morning right before you're about to go to sleep so you keep reading because you know slow burning anticipation that had been building through like three quarters of the book is finally reaching a peak and you need to either a test the limits of your vibrator or B, make the, make it to the inevitable conflict just to cool yourself off a little bit. You know, it's classic. Classic story. <laughs> Hot damn. Why is all of that so true? <laughs> but in all seriousness, if you were unfamiliar with this trope, Enemies to Lovers is obviously a story about two rivals that reluctantly fall for each other. Um, arguably one of my favorite tropes. Like, I would say maybe is my favorite trope. What do you think it is about enemies to lovers that we find so appealing? Oh, there's a lot. This trope is definitely one of my, like, top three. Um, mm -hmm. I think, and we'll talk more about this later, a, a lot of why I like it is it's very realistic. It, my relationship is, I think enemies is a little too strong, but people who disliked each other initially um, that that's, that describes my relationship. And it was yeah. because of misunderstandings, like 100% just misunderstandings and bad communication. Mm -hmm. So it's a very realistic um, as far as relationships go and the sexual tension that starts to build over just hating somebody, but then for some reason you're attracted to them. Um, yeah that that is a, a a big one for me yeah. do you think the like hate fueled sexual tension is some of the spiciest yeah um and like example like in the hating game by sally thorne which you have not read yet um their sexual tension is so intense like they're uh, Without giving too much away, there are moments yeah. because they're like basically two pe they're in an office together and their desks are right across right across from each other. And there are m moments in time throughout the book where they're just staring at each other, like glaring at each other. And you're just like, oh God. <laughs> yes. Just yes. <laughs> and it's funny because something just occurred to me, right? Like you and I both met our spouses at work. Mm -hmm. And they were our enemies at work. Yeah. And I think that's another reason is it seems like a lot of enemies to lovers, um, at least for contemporary romance, it's office romance. And it's because really, where do you spend enough time with somebody to really get to know them? And right. it's, you spend time with people either at work or at school, at least, you know, in your 20s or whenever people are meeting people. But I remember, um, you know, my, so my husband's a, a very tall, large brooding man. He's six, <laughs> four, um, total, total, you know, cinnamon roll, teddy bear, but big, tall guy. And I was his boss. We worked together in a coffee shop and, um, he, <laughs> he would be like in his little apron, <laughs> <laughs> this big tall guy in this apron and I'd just be sitting there like he's such an asshole and I'm looking at him stuffed into this tiny little apron and it's just so funny like now yeah. thinking about about that that you know the example you gave of staring at um your enemy across glaring the cubicles. at your enemy and mm -hmm. for me I was staring at Rick in his apron while he's yeah. like restocking the bait case <laughs> <laughs> or washing the dishes god <laughs> Just like look at him, just fucking washing the dishes. Like he owns the place. I know that prick. God, <laughs> very good, <laughs> very good. But you also get a lot of that forced proximity, um, mm -hmm. which I think is why you know in an office setting it works really well. Um, but really, any any enemies to lovers is going to have that forced proximity aspect to it where whether yeah. it's a road trip that they have to take together or some mm -hmm. kind of like 
work conference or um, you haven't read this, but another Allie Hazelwood book, um, Check and Mate. Um, it's kind of a, a new adult. So like young 20s, like early college age, um, they're enemies in the professional chess world, but they end up doing all these tournaments together and they end up on like a chess team together and it's just a, another classic Perfect. enemies to lovers yeah. story yeah. <laughs> it's it was really good love yeah that. love that and i like the like character development that happens throughout an enemies to lovers because i think first and foremost like you're seeing flawed people and i yep. think that our desire when we're reading these books i mean our desire in general is to be desired <laughs> flaws and all right so yeah um yeah someone who loves you for who you are and I think that that is something that you get when you're reading an enemies to lovers it's like very much you have these like very raw kind of tr not trouble necessarily but like they make mistakes real. and they do dumb things yeah. yeah it's just real people um and seeing how they can uh, get to this place of like a happily ever after I think is really sweet and part of that is the slow burn. It's yeah. you, you have all of this character development of these two individual people. You get to really explore their personalities and why they have these misconceptions about each other. And I, I think, you know, since I'm fairly new to contemporary romance in the context of, you know, what we're talking about, I'm, I'm just drawing on my own experience of what I've been reading over the last six months in the contemporary romance mm -hmm. world. So it's typically the female main character um just hates the male main character with mm -hmm. a like all of the fury of <laughs> a thousand angry toddlers <laughs> and um it's you it's more often than not that he falls first and he does these little sweet little things that she kind of picks up on throughout but there's some misunderstanding, some major misunderstanding. And I'm, I'm thinking of Spanish love deception where she thinks that he's being like condescending and not backing her up, like in these like boardroom meetings or whatever, but really he's just letting her stand as a confident woman on her own. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and that it's funny because that was a lot of the conflict that Rick and I had um, when I was his boss, <laughs> we did not date while I was his boss at all. We became friends and, um, the dating came way later, but, mm -hmm. um, I actually took him into the office to straight up ask him, like, are you a misogynist? Because which <laughs> you know, Rick, and you know how ridiculous yeah. that is to even yeah. suggest, yeah. Yeah. but, um, yeah. it just, the conflict that we had, I just felt like he was butting heads with me so much. And now <laughs> It's taken a long time to realize a lot of why we butt heads is actually because of my ADHD. <laughs> because I would like take out a tray of like cookie dough to bake cookies, but then forget that I set them there while the oven was preheating. And then they would just like melt and we'd have to throw them away. And he'd be like, were you going to bake those? And I took that like super offensively. So it's, it's funny. Cause that's exactly like with, um, Catalina and Aaron, the main characters from Spanish Love Deception, that's a lot of what they experience is just missed cues and mis misunderstandings yeah. in the way they speak to one another, specifically oh, the way yeah. he speaks to her. Yeah. But there's like conflict resolution <laughs> within these books gives me hope, you know? <laughs> yes. To I'm look like, forward oh, it can to. happen. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I generally love the dialogue in an enemies to lovers because there's always some sort of like fun banter. It's usually very like teasing and taunting. And I think enemies to lovers that are done well are just that it's a tease. It's a taunt. Like they're always kind of bickering. It's not offensive. Like it's not the other person yeah. like out for blood or whatever, even though that's kind of like what's represented generally but it's always kind of yucky to read <laughs> an enemies to lovers that where the the banter has taken a turn and you're just like oh this feels not okay <laughs> little, yeah what comes to mind and i think because 
you and I, and, and really like the whole point of the shadow baddies is that for the most part, we like everything we read. Like we can mm-hmm. find something to like about everything we read because we just enjoy the escapism, but yes. icebreaker, I fucking loathed. <laughs> yeah, it was so you bad. And I and- have <laughs> really despised icebreaker. And it's, I all, know. Like, we, we always come back to talking shit about icebreaker. I know. And we don't want we need we don't to read more shit. bad books. I know. No, we don't. And but folks, we need better. We, don't we need different shit, examples. But holy smokes, we did not finish Icebreaker, right? We skimmed. No, I skimmed like two hundred pages because I was like, "How yeah. is there more? How could there possibly be more?" Yeah. But with enemy celebrities being such a character-driven trope or and dialogue-driven trope, like if you don't fully develop those characters, where as the audience, as the reader, you understand the female main character, you identify with her. She's usually a Mm -hmm. strong woman in some kind of like Mm -hmm. powerful situation, um, which is why I like Allie Hazelwood so much for enemies to lovers, because Mm -hmm. it's like academic and STEM and, you know, science and math. And um, I'm a a geek who never got to break into that world Mm because I didn't know I could do math until I was 36. Anyway, um, (laughs) So I like that because she's constantly challenged in an academic setting and a professional setting like the the character is. Um, mm-hmm. And it always seems like the male main character is some condescending misogynist and he never is. Um, yeah. But with with Icebreaker, there was like no reason for the female main character to be such a cunt. Like, no, there really wasn't. And the dialogue was terrible. Dude, she was the such bickering, a bitch. Like, yeah, she just like threw a fit for no reason. So it just wasn't relatable at all. Um, no. And it was like, f- love someone, flaws and all. Here's the thing. She wasn't a lovable character. <laughs> it's like, I didn't understand why the, ma- the why, why the MMC was so obsessed with her. Right. Why he fell first. It's like, what, what yeah. is it you like, like about why? this chick? Yeah. Because she's just <laughs> she sucks. horrible. <laughs> Yeah, she just sucks. And Um, it had a pregnancy trope. It was everything we hated. (laughs) It was everything we hated. We are going to do a whole episode about pregnancy tropes, too, because that is... We talked about it in today's episode that I put out. um, The ACA War (laughs) wrap-up. Oh, boy. Anyway. Yeah, anyway. I like like also about enemies to lovers and and what makes it so appealing, and then we can kind of move on from this, is that the female main character is always wrong about the male main character. And again, I'm using these heteronormative, um, you know, examples of relationships just because that's what I've been reading, but that's not, um, that's just because I don't read a lot of uh, contemporary romance. So I haven't read any Mm non-heteronormative, heteronormative mm -hmm. um, romance books yet. So um, the FMC is always wrong about the MMC, but Mm -hmm. has, good reason to be misled that this enemy is an asshole. Um, Yeah. Which then we, as the reader start to see these sweet little things that the MMC is doing that makes us feel a little more clued into what's actually happening between them. Um, I I think of Aaron Blackford um, having food constantly for Catalina in the Spanish love deception like the granola bar thing was just like the sweetest thing to me. So sweet. Yeah. So sweet. Like just, just <laughs> And then did he make it, them yeah. himself? Were they homemade granola bars? They were homemade granola <laughs> bars. Yeah. I just so think of cute. like when Rick knows that I'm having a snack attack and he he just like brings me food. Like it's the mm-hmm. ultimate show of love is yeah. knowing how someone operates and just being ready. Like Here's water and ibuprofen. You know, that's mm-hmm. usually my my love language is water and ibuprofen. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. It's very thoughtful. Yeah. <laughs> I went to the store yesterday and did some groceries and brought home some Cadbury cream eggs for David because they're his favorite. <laughs> and then he I, like, opened you know, it. It's like funny. something so simple. He like opened the bag. Yeah, I know, Does He opened the bag and he was like... <laughs> Did you give me Cadbury cream eggs? <laughs> Go away, I do that for Rick too. I'll get like an assortment of Russell Stover's, um, whatever season, like whatever holiday it is. I'll grab whatever yeah. Russell Stover's little, <laughs> you know, 
one piece chocolates and he gets really excited. <laughs> so we've already kind of naturally explored this um, just throughout our conversation, but <laughs> is this enemies to lovers trope reserved for fictional characters who can afford therapy? Or do you think that this is just a good mirror to society and the way a lot of relationships are formed these days. Right. Because you already explored how your own relationship was an enemies to lovers type thing, or like how a, much I, ha I hated Rick maybe and his not apron. like an yes. enemies to lovers, but like, a, <laughs> at least like a dislike. <laughs> yes. I know. I'm like, lovers. um, rivals. I don't even know what we, yeah co-workers to lovers i don't know but and i've mentioned this before so is was my relationship david and i hated each other when we first met like if yours was like a rivalry to lovers ours was a downright honest to god dislike of each other wow and I, I will say a lot of that had to do with me i was probably the cause of that um, not probably. I definitely was. I was in like a really terrible relationship at the time and I was just in a very bad place in my life. And David was brought on as like the kind of, uh, manager. He was hired on as, as a manager at the sushi bar that I worked at. And I was just like, who's this young guy? He's like two years younger than me. I was like, who's this young guy <laughs> <laughs> strolling in here? Like he owns the place. <laughs> taking a position that should have been offered to me like I was just no. so salty and I used to challenge him all the time I was I would like forget that I was on the schedule and then show up like an hour late and <laughs> really wow yeah. he he took me into the office with the write-up or no he, it was a verbal and he was like so this is a write-up. He was like, this is a verbal warning. This is your write-up. This will be the next step. And I laughed at him. I went, oh, okay, David. And then I walked out. Yeah, it was wild. And then... Were you attracted to him, though, at the same time? Or were you just like, yes, fuck this guy? Definitely. But it was like, I wasn't going to admit to that. And he, at some point, realized how kind of like awful of a relationship I was in. And it was almost like, sh like things kind of shifted. Cause he, he was like, he was like basically focused on getting me away from this other guy. And I'll never forget like the day that I left this guy, I ended up coming in and I looked at David square in the face and I was like, I can, I can go up to 40 hours a week now. And he was like, why? And I was like, well, I need to because I moved out and I left this person and he gave me this huge hug like Aww. and it was like a moment for us in our relationship where it was just like oh shit this guy we're friends now <laughs> misunderstanding who, who would have known that's the foundation for any happy marriage what makes a great enemies to lovers for you and keeps you wanting more well I think over everything else, it is that kind of like slow burn and anticipation, like the will they, won't they. I mean, we know that they will, but <laughs> the back and forth and how that, <laughs> that, how that ebbs and flows throughout the story, I'm obsessed. I can't get enough of it. It just feels like one big tug of war and it's very sexy and dramatic and it's it's my favorite part. Yeah. I, I agree. I'm trying to think of what does this well. Well, you had some suggestions for this, which was Allie Hazelwood's yeah. Love on the Brain. For sure. <laughs> Just because I loved the characters. I loved both of them. Um, and the love hypothesis. They're formulaic. Hers, hers can, they follow the same format for sure. There's always like a, a you know, third act kind of breakup or conflict. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, which is another thing I want to talk about. Usually with enemies to lovers, you don't have that third act breakup. That's one thing that um, I don't like about Talia Hibbert is there's always that, that moment, you know, after they finally consummate the relationship, then they, some Something bullshit happens and then they, yeah. <laughs> yes. And then they have to come back together. And 
I think also just the um the sheer volume of romance books I've been reading makes these things jump out at me more. If I read them yeah. in isolation, it wouldn't bother me as much. Yeah. But that's something with um, Love on the Brain and the Love Hypothesis I noticed is there's the third act Scooby-Doo reveal. Yeah. <laughs> um, where there's always like someone either at the college or at NASA who mm-hmm. is trying to undermine the the female main character, take her job or whatever. And um, she always thinks it's the love interest and it never is. He's, yeah. he's, he's golden. He's great. He's, he's golden. He's ripped. He usually has yeah. dark hair and blue eyes. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what else? They always have yeah. dark hair and blue eyes. What is that? God. It, it, I feel like if you don't like the formulaic stuff and I – love it so much it's reliable <laughs> it's like it's always on it time. is it's always yeah. on time <laughs> it is and it's not that I, I don't like it. it it's I think it's just that I've been reading you know back to back like I finish a book and then I open the next mm-hmm. book and so mm-hmm. I need to break up my genre and and you know read different books in between because that's why it yeah. comes out at me so much but um all right do you want to talk about dialogue and banter and talk a little more about the hating game yeah um i do and i'll tell you what (laughs) the banter is one of those things that i also find like it has to be there for me um that's why i think ali hazelwood's books are so great because it's very smart banter um, yeah. and books like the hating game for me are great because they're just, they're two rivals in the same office that are just kind of like picking each other apart. And usually it's like, he's Uber. That book also has like grumpy and sunshine and he is very like stoic and almost like robotic. Like he has all of his shit organized so perfectly. <laughs> And she's over there, like, wearing polka dots and just, like, bright and chaos and fun. Yep. Yeah, a little, bit, yeah. a little bit chaotic. And um, she always jokes about him, like, being so straight-laced. And, like, in the, in the book, they're, like, playing these games with each other. And she'll, like, she, like, memorizes what color of shirt he's going to wear on what day he wears it because he's so, like, organized See, like I- that. <laughs> I love those little details. That's what I mean. And that's why this trope works so well is you get little things like that. It's the mundane Mm -hmm. shit that happens in real Mm -hmm. life that you start to notice about these people in your life. Yeah. Like, and I think that's why it's so relatable. And it's super cute because. Yeah. It's noticing the the six foot four guy in his apron. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's noticing the details. And then there's like a moment in the in the book where she's like, you're not wearing a gray shirt today. And he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, he has no idea that she's been paying attention. <laughs> That's cute. What are, like, if you had to choose two of your favorite enemies to lovers books, what are your top two? So I'm going to preface this with... <laughs> We purposely did not want to talk about uh, fantasy in mm-hmm. in this episode. We wanted to focus on classic and contemporary romance. So um, my top two, and I've referenced this a couple times, the Spanish love deception. To me, it was the best enemies to lovers, except for my number two choice, which I'll get to. <laughs> um, so just to kind of summarize the Spanish love deception, um, what do you do? When you need a date for your sister's wedding in Spain, reluctantly agree to take your office enemy when he offers to be your fake boyfriend. Like the premise of that is just ridiculous. Okay. Like the book starts out with (laughs) her talking to a friend on a lunch break. Like I need somebody for this, this wedding it's in Spain, blah, blah, blah. And he just like randomly appears and volunteers to go and they don't have like any kind of friendship. So you're just like, what the fuck? It's wild. Um, yeah, Aaron, you're into it though. <laughs> our, we're into it. We are into Aaron for sure. He is a broody, granola bar making, insufferable, but tall, dark, and handsome asshole um, <laughs> who volunteers himself to go to Spain, which I mean, there could be worse things. 
Um, sure. What I liked is that in spite of how silly forced proximity can present um, in romance novels, um, it was really cute because of all the little details, like um, him helping her with work projects mm -hmm. or, you know, obviously them having to travel together and, and you just get lots of like really, really sweet moments. And there's always going to be some kind of forced, like obligatory one bed situation. You must. And so I love, yeah. you <laughs> must. And so I loved seeing how she worked with that. I thought that that was really clever and, and cute. If you couldn't already tell by the amount of times I mentioned it, the hating game by Sally Thorne is definitely one of my favorite enemies to lovers. I feel like I had a hard time getting that out because <laughs> I had a hard time choosing just two of them, but this book, it really stuck with me. I think I've read it a couple of times because I was so obsessed with the characters. And there are a lot of things throughout the book that I don't necessarily love, but I think, well, let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about the book. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so it's basically executive assistants to co-CEOs of a publish publishing company, Lucy and Josh, hate each other. Their hatred is displayed through a series of ritualistic, passive-aggressive games as they sit across from each other every day in the office. The game gets a bit more intense when they fight for the same promotion. So it's very much like grumpy and sunshine. They're going for the same position. They reluctantly admire each other, which I think is really great. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's just a very <laughs> fun, flirty story. My second choice, which I think would also fall as, as one of your top three, the ultimate slow burn enemies to lovers is Pride and Prejudice. Mr. <laughs> Darcy. Um, <laughs> You've got tons of misunderstandings, hurtful words, sharp, witty tongues, and class norms. The rejection of two marriage proposals yeah. for a woman her age at that time mm -hmm. was absolutely frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Discussions of wealth, class, women's rights, marriage yeah. norms. It's, yeah. it's full of everything and another just good mirror to society. And I think a lot of those things still apply now. Like... Even yeah. though expectations have changed, I think, especially where you and I are from in Utah, the expectation of women and like, it took me moving out of Utah to realize having a child at almost 40 is kind of normal. And like our family's mm -hmm. from Europe and <laughs> our cousins all had their kids at 40. So like, yeah, it's not abnormal elsewhere, no. but when you're surrounded no. by that you know and you grow up and all your friends are getting married at 20 21 and having their first kid and you just feel like all this pressure and you're like I don't even know myself so I think that's another reason why Pride and Prejudice jumps out at me um it connects mm -hmm. yep yeah and I mean not to mention the fact that it's the <laughs> ultimate slow burn oh yeah the <laughs> slowest burn oh my god <laughs> it's so very good Anyway, the I will say that the movie, the Kira Knightley me. adaptation of that was very good. Oh, it yeah. was very good. I watch it, it all the time. It I have the me too. Oh, yeah. soundtrack downloaded. <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> oh, that scene um, mm -hmm. when he proposed, that proposal scene. Oh, my God. Oh, in the rain? You kidding? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> When he gets so just good. like a little bit close, like it's so chaste, but like so hot too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so All very right. good. Um, what is your so my number second two? Pick, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. One that I ha actually haven't mentioned this entire time, but it's Beach Read by Emily Henry. And now I really love Emily Henry. I love her writing style. I love her characters. She writes really interesting characters. And I think she has very interesting new kind of ideas for romance. I feel like we can all kind of get trapped in the same formula, like we were talking yeah. about earlier, and this and kind of similar stories. Um, but this was completely different and new for me, and I'll tell you about it. So it's a story about Augustus, a dark fiction writer, and his polar opposite romance, happily ever after writing neighbor, January. So rivals in college, the two help each other out of their creative ruts. 
Gus will spend the summer writing something happy while January will pen the next great American novel. And it's basically a story. Yeah. She like basically January go like, okay. So after the passing of her father, she moves into his old, like kind of vacation home, I think is what it is. I can't really remember if it's a vacation home or like his old house. So she's already got like some personal issues. She lost her father. Suddenly it's all very like, sad for her and she's like learning more about his life in this small beach town and then she moves in only to find that she is living next door to her college rival who is Gus and um like he's like this very dark writer he'll like kill off all of his characters and she only writes like happily ever after romance so they kind of swap what they're gonna write for the summer because they're both kind of (laughs) stuck in a writing rut um and I love it in that it kind of like forces them to come together because she, t- she's like, okay, you're going to have to, we're going to have to do research together. So I'm going to take you to like all of these cute, intimate, like the drive-in theater. So you can experience like these cutie little dates that like to get you inspired and we'll go to the carnival together. Or, like she just takes them on all these cute dates. Um, and then he takes her like into the woods to like interview a cult and stuff like that. Like it's very well like, <laughs> wild. Yeah. Um, and, but then they start to, obviously they start to get to know each other and like have this deeper connection, but it's very cute. The characters are very cute. And um, it was just a completely different romance enemies to lovers romance that I had ever read. So I appreciate the book very much and I highly suggest. Yeah. Awesome. I've got it on my list for this month. So yes, it's on our March TBR. Thank you so much for listening to our therapy session. Uh, Let us know what your favorite enemies to lovers books are and and drop us some, uh, some recommendations that we can add to our already just massive TBR. Um, We're still kind of growing and figuring things out. So like, and subscribe and share and follow along And remember to read those guilty pleasures because there is no guilt in our pleasure. Bye. Bye. Um, One thing (laughs) we need to do is a a still image. Um, Yeah, that's good. I have icebreakers. Should I just hold it upside down? (laughs) (laughs) I have to tell you a funny story and we may cut this out. So the other day, um, we had to lift our mattress off our bed frame because Artie decided to throw up under the bed. Sure. (sighs) Pets. Um, And Rick's like, oh, I didn't realize our mattress had a handle and it wasn't a handle. It was my vibrator that I took under the the edge of the (laughs) mattress.